Okay, so get ready to have your brain have a workout by the time we're done with the scenery. That's a guarantee because when I watch him in interviews, my brain, if there's muscles, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Listen to him. Uh, my guest today is Nick Bostrom, who's a professor at University of Oxford, director of Future of Human Institute. He wrote a book where two people that you may have heard of recommended it to everybody to read. One man, his name is Bill Gates, maybe you've heard of Bill Gates, the other man is Elon Musk, and the book he wrote was called, it's called Super Intelligence, Paths, Dangers, Strategies, 2014 he wrote it, became a New York Times bestseller. Uh, uh, he's done many different talks on TEDx, 200 different publications. I don't know how many interviews you've done, but 2,000 plus interviews, and uh, uh, in many ways he is referred to as one of the most important thinkers of our age, and the conversation today is gonna to be, what can we do? How, what is the risk of having technology, AI, robots grown as advancing at the pace that they're advancing? Is the strategy to slow them down or something else? Thank you so much for being a guest on Valuetainment. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, let's get to it. So Nick, t so tell us, you, you, right now, with everything that's going on, you got guys that are talking about uh, the AI from the standpoint of we need universal basic income. This is not that conversation, right? You got guys that are talking about, you know, AI is advancing way too fast, we should slow it down. Some are saying it's nothing to worry about. It's been going like this for a long time. We never had computers. Back in the days, we went on typewriters. We were so worried about what movies were gonna do, what televisions were gonna do. Why is this such a different time? And what are your thoughts about the negative side effects of technology and AI? I don't think we should slow AI down. I think it's rapidly increasing in capability and that it's not impossible that within the lifetime of a lot of people alive today, we might see a transition to a machine intelligence era, uh, an era where the human brain is no longer the uh, place where the action is. And why where do you we believe might have that? Super intelligent machines. So why I believe that yeah. this is a why do you believe that? Plausible. Yeah. Well, um, it's um, mostly based on observing the rapid recent pace uh, of uh, progress in machine learning, deep learning. Okay. Um, the sense that it looks like this is quite tightly connected to the hardware that we have available, which is growing, <clears throat> and we can expect to continue to uh, grow the uh, the hardware performance that these systems are implemented on. And it will probably require some new breakthroughs as well, but if we just see how far we've come, even just in the last eight years or so, it seems rash to rule out that we might have enough progress within you know, the lifetime of some current folk um, to get this transition. Uh, I'm not uh, by any means certain that this will happen, but it seems more likely than not. Do you have, are you somebody who, do you have kids? Are you a parent? Are you a father? Mm -hmm. Okay, do, so you're not concerned about, you know, what role technology is gonna play in their lifetime where they're still gonna have a purpose. Obviously it's an odds game, you don't know for a fact, but in your mind you're thinking, this is the direction we're going. Is it just gonna be a different way of living for us? Or is there going to be a threat where eventually we're controlled by the machinery? Well, I think on the downside, we have significant risks, including existential risks. So this would be threats to the very survival of Earth originating intelligent life or ways which could permanently destroy the future by locking ourselves in to some radical suboptimal state. Um, but there is also an upside to this. Like if things go well, if we avoid these disaster scenarios, then I think superintelligence would unlock a much bigger and better future for humanity. Um, and I'm quite excited about that potential for actually good things to come out of this. Also, <clears throat> in addition to unlocking this upside, I think getting superintelligence right would help with a lot of other existential risks that we will otherwise be confronting in this century. Such as? From, uh, uh, synthetic uh, biology, for instance, that will make it increasingly easy to enhance pathogens and 
democratize that capability by making these tools easier to use and more widely available. Got it. So you're you're familiar with Samuel Butler's essay "Darwin Among uh, the Machines," right? The 1863. I'm assuming you are, right? You know, you, I, I might have heard of it. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna put, so I don't he, have it. So he says he says uh, in 80 in 1863 he wrote this essay saying Darwin among the machines predicted the domination of humanity by intelligent machines. Uh, that eventually these guys are gonna dominate the rest of us and we can't do anything and we're gonna be having to bowing down to them. Do you think that is likely to happen? Well, I don't think that would be a bowing down scenario. I think in a lot of these um, existential risks, uh, humanity is simply wiped out and the resources around Earth and in the solar system and beyond are then reformatted and used for some other goal instead. You, you, you know the talk you gave on TED where you're like, you know, uh, uh, if we measure all, ourselves against the gorilla, or the ape, you know, it is so much more powerful even than the strongest man in the world. Yet at the same time, our capability is, you know, our brain, function, processing, thinking, all that stuff, right? So the edge there is strength. The edge for us is we can think, process issues, make better decisions, let's just say. So what is our edge over computers and AI? What edge do we have? Well, we get to build them. And so we get at least one shot to get it right. If we can engineer them in such a way that they are actually a kind of extension of our own will, maybe in an idealized form, if we can align them with our intentions and values, then that would be on our side. And it would be a huge boost for, for our goals and uh, aspirations. So if we build them, because we have control to build them, but at the same time, you, you know, the world is filled with good people and bad people, right? So some people, you know, build things with a positive motive. Some people build things with negative motive. Let's say the noble people that build them with a positive motive. What if the ones that are going to build it with a negative motive because they're driven by power, control, force, you know, and they build this machine that's stronger, thinks better, you know, does everything better than us. If there's one area that they can't build it to be, even the most evil person in the world, say the most evil person in the world wants to build a robot because he wants to take over and rule the planet, hypothetically. We've seen this in movies, novels. It's not the first time we have seen this or read this, right? Even at that level, is there anything we have an edge over the best machine, robot, any intelligence that's uh, built by man? I mean, for now, obviously, the machines are very limited. I think eventually they will become way uh, more capable than any human individually, and at some point after that, more capable than all humans taken together. I don't think we will have any edge uh, from any you know, physical or intellectual capacity post that. And at that point, we would be dependent on these having been designed in such a way that they're actually... Um, do what we are intending for them to do. Um, they, they need to be on our side, I think, basically, in order for humanity to have a, a bright future or even a, any future at all in this kind of scenario. Um, so the good news is that like, while I was writing the book, this was an almost entirely neglected area. Uh, a lot of people working on AI, but hardly anybody working on thinking about what happens if AI succeeds. But since then, there is now an active uh, research subfield working on AI safety and on creating scalable methods for AI control that could apply no matter how smart and capable a learning system becomes. And some really clever people going into that field. So some progress is being made there. I mean, we'll see whether um, a, a sufficient solution to these have become available by whatever time we need it, which is like when some other researchers figure out how to create machine super intelligence. So there is a kind of race on, right, between the majority trying to make super intelligent machines as quickly as possible, and then a minority working to make sure that by then we will have the relevant control and safety technologies. Yeah, but I guess the way I'm looking at it is from the risk standpoint, right? Like, uh, uh, you know, we just experienced a pandemic, and it shut down America, shut down the world, it shut down... Europe, Central America, America, it shut down everywhere, right? And let's say that was an accident and that's, you didn't, it was an intentional thing that happened. Great. What if somebody wants to do that intentionally, the power to want to shut everybody down? So then the conversation becomes, 
uh, uh, recently, one of the main leaders of our Department of Defense just resigned because he said the amount of uh, uh, intelligence and experience China has on cyber warfare is years w ahead of us where we can't even compete against those guys. So I'm, I'm resigning. That's what he said when the article came out. This was last week. But I'm talking about more. I'm from Iran. So the biggest challenge historically has been with Iran. Hey, we don't want you to build any nuclear weapons. Fine. Okay, we're not building nuclear weapons. You sure? We're not building any nuclear weapons. Can we come inspect? Sure. Anywhere? You can inspect anywhere except these nine places. Well, then maybe they're building it in those nine places, right? So what I'm trying to say is, say somebody is not as noble as you are, and if they really have motivations of power, influence, control, how far can they go with AI the next 5, 10, well, 15, 20, 30 years? Well, I don't know about 30 years. I mean, right now, we know that um, the leading edge of AI development is um, mostly in the public domain. In fact, the best researchers are falling over themselves to publish as quickly as possible their latest findings, uh, putting it on preprint archive servers even before it can appear in, in journals. Yep. Um, now, it's it's very possible that at some point uh, this will shift uh, to a more closed development regime. Um, and at that point, it might become harder to know um, who who is where in, in, in the race to uh, to develop AI. Um, but, but for now, we have a pretty good grasp. Um, and uh, I think it would be quite hard at present to uh, mount a competitive effort in complete secrecy because all the best researchers are really keen to be able to publish because it's the way that they can show to the other researchers how good they are, right? If, if you're just doing something in the bowels of some corporation and you're not allowed to tell anybody about it, uh, it kind of sucks if you're one of these people who could get worldwide fame or, or you know, renown amongst your fellow researchers. Um, and at the moment, really great AI researchers is in such strong demand that they can kind of have their pick. And a lot of them prefer to work for uh, corporations or universities that, that allow open publishing. Um, so, some but, of these, some but of then these, again, that might change. Some of these things change, uh, vary uh, based on the country, right? Meaning in uh, China's not big on recognition, recognizing the individual. Everything's about the collective. And Iran's not big on recognition either for the individual because God forbid if somebody gets too much power, you know, maybe a second, a resurrection of the Shah could come up. So we can't give one person too much recognition. Meaning, in some of these societies, some of these countries, y you're not doing it for you. You're doing it for the country. So even the fellow researcher that wants to get the kind of recognition in China, you can't do it anyways. So if, if somebody wanted to do it, it wouldn't be like, hey, look what I wrote. Here, look at this paper I just wrote. Here's what I'm working on. This is my findings. In some of these places, you cannot fully know how advanced they are. So uh, maybe let me take this in a different angle than, I mean, than we're going uh, But uh, China is publishing a lot of uh, uh, papers in AI more and more every year. Uh, there's like a kind of strong incentive structure in China to publish it, because like academics get rewards depending on how many papers they publish and so on and so forth. So, And, um, and from what you're seeing is what, what, uh, where are you saying the, seeing the biggest advancement? So uh, uh, hypothetically, like in your world, what is some technology that they're talking about being built today that maybe we saw in a movie 20 years ago, 40 years ago, that could become a reality? Well, do you mean within AI or? Within AI. Or? Yeah, within yeah, AI. Well, um, so, so there's like a kind of basic progress on techniques that can be applied. They are pretty general purpose. So if you look at some of the more impressive recent advances with large language models, for example, uh, OpenAI's GPT-3, <clears throat> which has, I mean, to simplify, it's ingested a huge amount of human written text, basically the internet. And you can then give it some text prompt and it will kind of continue writing in, in response to this prompt, maybe in the style that the prompt suggests. And it can write some paragraphs of text uh, that can still, in most cases, easily be uh, distinguished from human written prose, but in some cases, maybe for a paragraph or so, can trick you into thinking that it was a human writing it. And with occasional glimpses of sort of surprising um, incisiveness. Now, it looks like 
the performance of these large language models uh, scales with the amount of compute. So the more parameters, the, the more data you have, the better the, these models become. And so one interesting question is, as we scale up these models by maybe a few orders of magnitude, does that mean that we will really close in on the gap between the current models and what, what the ground human can do? Um, it also turns out that basically the same architectures that you can be used to do this kind of text generation, you can apply uh, for other modalities. So there are now systems like the clip system where you combine text and imagery and you can have uh, either generate imagery or you could have like input text and you could kind of imagine what a picture of that might look like and kind of in, in a multimodal way fuse these different information streams that, that we humans have and that, that our brains interpret in, in, in a quite neat way. So that's like one thing, like another recent thing was AlphaFold2 by DeepMind, the uh, AI that is able to, uh, uh, if not solve the protein folding problem, at least make like a dramatic amount of progress there um, with potentially important applications in the biosciences. Um, you know, if, we, if, we, if we go back a couple of years, obviously that was AlphaGo, uh, you know, where the game of Go was uh, conquered by AIs. And in all of these cases, it's, it's a relatively small set of techniques that are being applied and reapplied. So it's not like each of, each of these systems requires some degree of handcrafting, but the real engine, the real juice is kind of this, const, this, this knowledge we now have how to make machines learn. We have really figured out how to make machines learn. And that can then be applied to vision or to sound or to text uh, or to pretty much any domain. Um, so, so that's, I think that's like probably the most exciting thing that is currently happening is this deep learning revolution. Do you think it's possible to make a, uh, to teach machines not just how to learn but how to feel? I think there's a lot of uncertainty about um, the philosophy of mind question about what the criteria are for, say, being uh, sentient for having conscious experiences. It's something philosophers uh, have have wrestled with for for a long time. Um, I do believe that we will eventually have machines, digital minds, that are conscious. And that then will also have moral status. And that means that the question is not just what do they do to us or what do we do to each other with machine tools, but also what do we do to them? Um, so the ethics of digital minds, I think, will gradually arise as a really important issue. Today, it's a little bit outside the Overton window. It's a kind of wacky thing that you can't really... But, but I think the time has come now where at least some people have the luxury to be like, you know, in academia sitting and thinking about things all day long, uh, when we should be start to try to work out some of what this might look like. A world where, say, humans and AIs at different levels of capability and at different levels of sentience have to coexist in some kind of workable harmony. You ever seen a movie Her with Joaquin Phoenix? Mm-hmm. Do you know which one I'm talking about where he's... I, yeah, that's one where they have, like, the personal assistant, right? Yeah. Do you, time. Yeah, do you think it's ever going to come a time where man marries a robot because the robot can now do everything and anything that another human being can do, including feel? You think that day is ahead of us? Well, I mean, ever is a long time, right? So, um, but in terms of chat robots and stuff like that, that might be kind of rather around the corner. I mean, already exists in limited ways. It, it might be that at least for some applications, you don't really even need a fully convincing human-like interlocutor. It might be that the more limited thing will still be compelling to some people. Um, and I mean, maybe it will have utility as well. I mean, if you have like these personal assistants like Siri or, uh, and, and if they could start having a more kind of social relationship with the user as well. And, you know, learn to say encouraging things when they detect signs of somebody feeling down or like, I, I could imagine that that in a, in a small and gradual way starting to happen within the next few years. Um, but um, but ultimately, yeah, I mean, if you have machines that are completely equivalent to humans or, or beyond that and that are conscious, et cetera, then I don't see any reason why you couldn't have the same deep relationships between some humans and some machines as, as you currently have between some humans. 
you, you've, uh, you've argued that true AI, if it's realized, might pose a danger that exceeds every previous threat from technology, even nuclear weapons. And that if its development is not managed carefully, humanity risks engineering it its own extinction. Has your position changed with that or are you still in the same place with that? Yeah, I mean, in terms of the magnitude of threat, if we're talking about probability, that obviously goes up and down over time. So when uh, scientists first detonated uh, an atomic bomb, the Trinity test, um, there was some concern that maybe the high temperatures that would be generated could ignite the atmosphere and then that would kill all life. Concerned enough that uh, a number of studies were commissioned by uh, Robert Oppenheimer, who was the director of the uh, Los Alamos lab. And those calculations that were performed show that this shouldn't happen like in terms of the nuclear physics, like the new atmosphere is not ignitable. Um, and of course, they detonated the bomb and the atmosphere didn't ignite, which is a good thing for us. Um, but at the time, you might say that was a small existential risk that their calculations maybe could have been mistaken and then that would have been the end. And in fact, just a few years later when scientists were uh, developing the fusion bomb, the, the hydrogen bomb, they again made some calculations as to the yield of this experimental device that they were going to detonate. And they set it off, um, the Castle Bravo. Uh, detonation and and there it turned out there was a mistake in their calculation with the result that the yield was uh, two and a half times bigger than they had anticipated and so what this meant was that a, a huge blast arose uh, irradiating a Japanese fishing boat where one person died causing an international accident you could imagine the Japanese be kind of sensitive to nuclear after what they had gone through no and several islands yeah. had to be evacuated and it was like a big calamity a lot of the instruments they had set up to to, to record the detonation were destroyed by the blast. So it's a good thing that the calculation error was in this second experiment rather than in the calculation about whether the Trinity test would ignite the atmosphere. But then I think there were maybe larger existential risks during the height of the Cold War when the, arm, the world seemed to be on the brink of nuclear Armageddon on several occasions. Um, although it's not clear that that would have caused human extinction. Um, but now I think uh, if we're looking ahead over the coming decades, the biggest existential risks, and I think that will be unprecedentedly big, will arise from some technological breakthroughs we can be expected to make. A superintelligence being one, and then like synthetic biology being another. And, and there might be some further areas as well that could introduce these new factors into the world where we have no track record of living with this for many years or decades or, or millennia. And we're kind of rolling the dice anew with these brand new powers. You know, typically when something like right now, the conversation that's being talked about a lot is regulation with Bitcoin, cryptocurrency. So, you know, uh, one side is saying it'll never get regulated. Another side is saying it's already regulated. Another side saying it's, it's about to get regulated. So, but regulation comes up. We don't have control of this. The government's got to come in and see what's going on because there's a lot of money laundering going on. And these NFTs, we have to get regulation because... Uh, uh, some people are using NFTs as a way to launder money. Okay, fine. Do you think in, uh, do you think it'll ever get to a point? Again, ever is a long time, but do you think anytime soon we'll get to a point where uh, the level of regulation on AI needs to be a global thing rather than a national thing? Yeah, um, that that seems likely. I mean, if if you have 200 countries and each make their own independent choices about some of these things, then basically we'll have to assume that there won't be any larger scale externalities from these different technologies. Um, but we already have a lot of examples where there are externalities from what the country does. I mean, global warming being one example, where if you want to solve that, it's not enough that one country unilaterally reduce their own pollutions, like it has to be something most countries do. Um, and with some other things like nuclear weapons and biological weapons, we have made big efforts to limit the proliferation of nuclear weapons and to ban entirely biological weapons um, with a reasonable degree of success, but not complete success. Um, 
So it might well be, I mean, to some extent, it depends on how lucky we are with how new technologies pan out, but we might get technologies so destructive that it's unacceptable if even one actor uh, develops and deploys something. Then, then we, the, only, the only hope would be some kind of global agreement to prevent that. Have you seen the, the, the recent movie Machines versus the Mitchells, the cartoon? No, you haven't seen no. it? It's, 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 so my kids are like, hey, Dad, we got to watch Machines versus Mitchells. And I'm like, guys, I'm good. I don't need to watch this. But when we watch a cartoon, it's a good opportunity for me to take a nap. So I'm like, okay, great. Let's watch it. So we put it on. I'm watching this cartoon. All of a sudden, I'm like, man, it's this cartoon. I cannot fall asleep because this is actually very interesting. And it's a cartoon about machines taking over, you know, Mitchells. Mitchells is a family. and They can't fight back. And everybody unites. And, you know, they know how to bring everything together. And, and the human becomes the enemy. And even the movie iRobot. You've seen the movie I, I don't know if you've seen the movie iRobot where the robot becomes the enemy. The human becomes the enemy and they revolt against it. And, you know, most, many times we watch these movies... A lot of these movies eventually become a reality. It's just a matter of time where you're sitting there saying, are they making a possibility of what could happen in the future? What concerns you the most with the future? Everybody has a different concern. What concerns you the most with the future? Well, probably conflict ultimately. I mean, you can carve concern cake up in different ways. You can slice it or dice it. Um, but a lot of the biggest uh, existential risks, I think, arise from the fact that um, the world is splintered and you have different actors, different groups of humans currently working at cross purposes and intention and conflict with one another. And if they have more powerful tools to inflict damage on the other side, then more damage might happen. Um, now, you might say, haven't we already maxed out on that? Like with nuclear weapons during the Cold War, you could already have destroyed civilization. Well, A, nuclear weapons were actually quite uh, difficult to develop and expensive. So you couldn't just have any random person having their own nuclear weapon in their garage, right? It was like something states only could develop. And even then, you needed a big industrial program, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and B, they are relatively detectable. So you basically know who has nuclear weapons and who doesn't. Um, but that doesn't need to hold for future technologies we might develop. With bi biotechnology, for example, we might get the tools that enable an individual in the garage to make something um, uh, that, that could decimate the global population, right? And, and these things would be very hard to monitor because you don't need large facilities with like a power plant next door to pump in energy. You could just have some you know, test tubes and some chemicals and some biological specimens. Um, and there are other ways as well that the properties of nuclear weapons were somewhat stabilizing. So it's quite, <clears throat> it, it, would, it was not sufficiently easy to wipe out all the adversaries nuclear weapon to be sure that if you struck first, you would be safe. Like during the Cold War, both the Soviet Union and the US had a second strike capability. So that kind of stabilized things a little bit in a crisis because the alternative, right? Even if you don't want to destroy the other side, like you think that would be a great shame, but if you are worried that they could strike first and wipe you out, and that in a crisis situation, that could easily result to each side thinking, oh, we got to strike now, because even though we don't really mean harm to the others, we can't afford to take the risk of leaving ourselves exposed. The only way to be safe is to wipe out their side first. And so if, 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 they hadn't, if the technology had not been such that you could have a secure second strike capability, then you would have potentially a much less stable arms race and other technologies in the future, you know, might also be more unstable in that respect. Um, and, and there are further possibilities as well, but yeah, so I think a big category uh, of risk come from the, the, the kind of the fracturedness of the current world order. Um, also some accident risks arise more deeply from conflict. I mean, if, if you think it during the cold war, one, one thing that could have happened is that, uh, that would have been a nuclear war by accident, like some warning system malfunctioned or something. And in fact, almost happened on a couple of occasions uh, with able archer exercises and so forth. Uh, but the deeper cause of this it would have been the conflict because it's the nuclear com the conflict that led these arsenals to be built up in the first place and to put on here trigger alert. So even if the kind of immediate cause might be an accident, the thing that allowed that situation to rise where a small accident could cause this was the conflict. 
Interesting. Uh, do, do you look at it from the standpoint of uh, how uh, AI is going to impact every industry in a different way? Uh, you know, do you ever sit there and say, well, yeah, I kind of see this is this what could could happen with sports. Here's what could happen to warfare. Here's what can happen to music. Like, for example, music is all about math, right? So can we get to a point where an AI can take and come up with, uh, uh, you know, certain rhythm or music uh, that is perfect math and create any kind of a voice and put the lyrics together and sing it where, you know, the music entertainment industry could be disrupted because, you know, softwares are making better music than human beings are. Like, do you ever go deep to see how each industry is going to be affected by AI? Mostly we are focusing more on these, like, um, more general questions. Uh, and, and I think once you have sufficiently advanced capability, the answer to your question is, like, all of these areas will be affected and overtaken by machine. But, I mean, it's fun sometimes maybe just to think what is likely in the near term before we have this fully general AI. I mean, and with music, I got to say so far, the results are not that impressive uh, of what machines, I, th I think they get a lot of the more local structure, right? Like the so small little snippets of music would sound really convincing and good, but the larger architecture and the sort of the meaning of the whole piece is something that so far has not really been produced by these music generating AIs. But what we'll see how, how how that goes when we scale up the systems, because in, in other arts, when we have scaled up basically the same algorithm, but uh, it has gotten more of this kind of holistic context. So maybe, maybe that, that might happen uh, in, in the relatively near term, these kind of music generating AIs becoming pretty decent. You know, every time I do an interview, I got like, you know, I'll ask 5, 10, 15, 20 questions, but I got the one question that I'm trying to get an answer for myself. It's not even for the audience. I'm trying to get All right, it. So, let's, let's see what we can no, do. No, no, I've asked it. I've asked it already a few times. I'm just trying to get a little bit clearer about it. But for me, it's, you know, uh, 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 I'm 6'4 245, okay? My best vertical leap I ever had was maybe, you know, 30 inches, let's just say. Okay, it's my vertical leap. Okay. So I know I'm limited to how high I can jump. I know my limits on how high I can jump. Okay, great. So I'm limited in my ability to jump. In, uh, in, in basketball, the highest vertical leap they've ever had is 48 inches, some say 51 inches, but let's just say that's the number. We are limited to how high we can jump. Animals have a limit to what they're capable of doing. We all have limits, right? And when people say, you don't have any limits, okay, it's a great motivational quote, but there's a certain limit that we all have. And the sooner you know your limits, and certain areas that maybe you don't have a limit, you can go out there and do great things with. Back to AI. If we know animals are limited, human beings are limited to certain things they could do, what, what is, what, is there any limitations that AI and machines and technology can have? And if yes, what would that be? Yeah, I mean, there are, but they're very high up, as it were. I mean, basically, at that point, we have to look at the the fundamental physics involved, uh, physics of computation. And so there are limits to how fast signals can uh, propagate. We have, you know, speed of light ultimately limits how fast the signal can go from one point to another. So that means if you have a lar very large computer, at some point internally there will be limits to the serial depth of computation, the speed of the serial computation you can perform because it'll just take a long time for one part of the computer to communicate with another part. Uh, there are also limits like the black hole limit. Like if you if you really made a really sufficiently large uh, computer, eventually the mass of this would collapse it into a black hole, right? There are limits to uh, the amount of uh, like energy use uh, if you want to erase information. There's like the smallest amount of um, negentropy that you have to expand to erase one bit of information. So if you want to do irreversible computation, there's limits to how efficient that can happen. And ultimately, there's also a limit in the universe to the amount of matter we can lay our hands on, starting from the Earth today. Even if we travel at the speed of light, there's a finite uh, sphere that we can access. Things beyond that will have receded from us by the time we get there because the universe is expanding. Um, 
So there are these various physical limits, uh, assuming our current understanding of physics is correct. Um, but but there are many, many orders of magnitudes above, uh, like as in not just two or three, I mean, in, in terms of the mass we can access, that, that would be on the order of maybe 10 to the power of uh, 20 stars or so. Uh, and each one of those could hold, you know, maybe 10 to the power of 30 times more beings around it than, you know, have lived around the Earth today. So so there's there's a lot of room uh, above our heads before we hit the ceiling of what physics permit. Crazy question for you. Is this possible? Okay, you seem like you're going to say yes because... Uh, your your general answer is anything is possible with AI because ever is a long time, so eventually they can figure it out. So let me kind of give this to you and try to either trash it or say, no, that could possibly happen one day. So, you know, half the time you, in America especially, I've lived in Iran, I've lived in Germany, I've lived here. In America, when you vote for a president, uh, people will typically hate the president because of personal reasons. They say, I don't like that, he's this, he's that. So it's easier to demonize a president. It's easier to demonize a Biden, a Trump, an Obama, a Bush, a Clinton, a Reagan. It's easy to demonize because it's a human being, right? Versus, um, you know, if there was no face on the president, it was ran based on predictive analytics, data on what's the best decision to make with this specific area, because we can run stats and we can write data to say the right tax system to run based on the, you know, what the system figured out here with this computer, with this AI, we should never tax people more than 22.5%. I'm just throwing a number out there to you, right? And so then, you know, this other uh, situation says based on the amount of wars that we've gone and the conflict that we've had with India, with China, with Iran, with this, 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 that, the right move right now is to do nothing or let's leave, or let's stay, let's stay five more months, Let, because it's all data, 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 right? Do you think there could come a time where we no longer have people running for presidents, we have uh, systems and computers and AI that we vote for? I mean, I think that would come late. I think there's a lot of kind of inertia embedded in the constitutional framework. So I'd imagine that would probably for some time be at least a figurehead. Now, you can always ask how much is this figurehead actually the thing that controls what the government does. Sure. I think you could ask that question already in the present world. Um, and I think true. in most cases in history, there's like one salient figure, but then there is some kind of elite around that. There are some institutions that constrain uh, their freedom of action. And maybe some of what constrains them in the future will increasingly be uh, these big information systems and algorithms running on them. Just like today, like say the market kind of constraints what, what you can do as a president. And then maybe, you know, there will be social networks that constrain you. And then maybe there will be other interactions between cyber systems that also you know, constrain what you can do. Because what, what, how can you talk shit to a system, right? You're like, we got three systems here to vote for. The predictive analytics ran by such and such university believes these are the decisions for us to make. And in the last 200 years, if we would have ran it based on this system, it would have done so. We can't get, say, that computer I don't like, he hurt my feelings, or it hurt my mm -hmm. feelings. We can't do that. But what you did say with your answer is maybe AI does have a certain limit, and the limitation it has is it can never be a president. I'm trying to figure well, out. Well, I mean, that's like if we decide that. I mean, uh, but I do think that <laughs> uh, the limit of not being able to become the object of our hatred, I don't think it's a real limit that wouldn't underestimate the human ability to hate. And I think we can hate individuals and we can hate nations and institutions and companies and systems and all kinds of things. I don't see why people couldn't bring themselves together to hate some uh, like predictive algorithm as well, if, if that's what it comes to. <laughs> I, I guess the, the part where I'm going, when, when I have the debate over God and I'm the skeptical guy, I'm the guy that got kicked out of Bible study in Iran because I'm like, if there's really a God, why the hell am I going to why am I seeing so many people dying? Why are we being bombed by Saddam Hussein? So, but it, the, the conversations about God, uh, uh, where logic, emotion, feelings, you know, decision-making process, choices, you know, to me, it eventually gets to a point where, you know, I don't know if technology can build feelings. I don't know if technology can build feelings because and you said, I'm sure we can figure out a way to hate something that's a machine. Believe me, I hated my Escalade last because I had no clue what the hell was going on with the suspension. 
So yes, you're right. I can't hate a machine because I hated my Escalade mm-hmm. last week. <clears throat> okay. And it couldn't figure out how to go down. I'm going down to Miami and I'm bumping all over the place. We figured out there was two things I had to fix and it was addressed. So yes, you're right. We can do that. But I'm just trying to see what is the one area that we have an edge over machines where long-term machines are going to need us rather than us desperately needing machines to survive. Yeah, I don't think there will be such an area. I think if machines need us, it's because somehow they care about us. And either that or there are some other machines that care about us. So that might give the first machine an instrumental reason to care about us. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, otherwise, I think from a practical point of view, I think ultimately there will be no physical outcome that we would be able to produce through our muscles or brains that some intelligent system couldn't produce equally well or better. You think so? Even yeah, feelings? I mean, sorry, I mean, right, I mean, yeah, so that's like... The super intelligence, obviously, if they are generally much more capable of solving problems than we are, then true. And and then like I mean, is it our fingers that are gonna be so intricate that you couldn't have a robotic manipulator that is able to do the same? No, I think that obviously with nanotech, they will have much more capable actuators as well. And so then at the fundamental level, there is nothing we can do. But it might well be that we have a position in the scheme of values that makes us uh, very important. Uh, I mean, this is the same way as like maybe, maybe I have like a, a, a grandmother or something who is dearly beloved and maybe she can't really do much. She can't hold a job and earn income or, yeah. you know, serve any practical. But if people care about her, then there is something only she can do, which is to uh, be alive and be happy. Nobody else can do that for her. And similarly, our role in the future might be the people who kind of actually enjoy this whole situation. And uh the people for whose sake all of this work is being done. And that would kind of, in some sense, be a more dignified role than being the worker, the arms and the legs of the whole apparatus. So then if that's the case, like intuition, you know, there's a different thing about intuition. You sit down with somebody, afterwards you say, babe, what did you think about the guy? I don't trust him. Yeah, me neither. You know, can, can AI get to that level to have the intuition that we have? Because sometimes it's not like, you know, 19 keys to have an intuition. It's kind of a gut raising, upbringing, who you're around to get a gut feeling. Can they duplicate feelings? Can they duplicate eyes looking at each other, that contact? I don't know. All I'm looking for is, uh, this is your world. I'm just trying to get smarter by talking to a guy who is living in the world where this is what you consume 24-7. I don't consume this 24-7. I'm just trying to get 1% smarter about the industry you're in than I was 45 minutes ago, and that's been my goal the entire time. So, I'm going to give you the last thoughts here, and here's how I'll phrase the question, and you can answer it any way you want. As a parent, uh, uh, as a human being, uh, are you optimistic about the future? Are you curious? Are you kind of like, man, I wonder how crazy these things can get? Are you like, man, what is the limitation on how much we can take technology and how, uh, uh, how much can this technology advance? What's your feeling about the future? If you were to say, this is my feelings about the future. I would characterize myself as a fretful optimist. Frightful optimist. Fretful. Fretful optimist. Got it. You want to unpack that a little bit? It's pretty self-explanatory. I mean, I think the uh, uh, there is the given our current state of ignorance, we can I- preclude either extremely good outcomes or or very bad ones, and we live in this uncertainty. Um, and we'll see how it uh, pans out. I like that. Fretful optimist. Uh, Nick, thank you for being a guest on Value Tell Me. We're going to put the link below to your book, Super Intelligence, Paths, Dangers, Strategies. New York Times bestseller. We'll put the link below. Thank you so much for making the time and being a guest on Value Tell Me. Great. I'm glad we could make it happen. You got it. Take thank care, you. buddy. Bye-bye. What do you think? Do you think uh, AI is going to take over? Do you think it's going to get to a point where... We may have a president that's a robot one day. Curious to know your thoughts. Comment below. If you enjoyed this interview, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. And you may also enjoy another interview I did with Pablo Holman, who's a futurist, I believe, and a hacker. Very interesting mind. If you've not seen that, click over here to watch it. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.